Welcome to the Schweike Media Expert webinar series where we team up with leading marketing and publishing experts to provide you with tips and best practices to help you grow your business and stay on the cutting edge. Welcome to the show. Hello everyone, I'm here today with Jay Bear, and Jay has spent 23 years in digital marketing and customer experience, consulting for more than 700 companies during that period, including 32 of the Fortune 500. His current firm, Convince and Convert, provides digital marketing advice and online customer service advice and counsel to some of the world's most important brands like the United Nations, Allstate, Cisco, and Cabela's. His new book, Hug Your Haters, is the world's first modern customer service manual showing how companies large and small can benefit from the enormous increase in online complaints and customer feedback. His second book, Utility, Why Smart Marketing is About Help Not Hype, was number three on the New York Times bestseller list and a runaway number one Amazon bestseller. Jay's Convince and Convert blog was named the world's number one content marketing blog by the Content Marketing Institute and is visited by more than 250,000 marketers each month. Jay also hosts and produces the Social Pros podcast, which is downloaded 65,000 times monthly and was named 2015's Best Marketing Podcast by Content Marketing Awards. And today we are going to talk about social customer service, why you need it, and how to do it right. Jay, how are you today? I am fantastic, my friend. Thank you for having me on the show. Fired up to talk about this topic. Absolutely. I, I, um, I assume you are seeing that you, that you wrote a book about it. <laughs> and uh, as I told you the other day, um, when I read it, I just, I, I really had my reservations. Like, what, what am I really going to learn here? You know? And, and, uh, once I dug in and read it, I was like blown away and was like, okay, I know a list of people that I need to either give this book to or send the link to buy it. And you probably, um, want me to send the link. <laughs> but yeah, I, uh, I don't care. It doesn't matter. As long as people read it, uh, it's fine. But I appreciate that very much for the kind words. But you're right. You know, I mean, I've written books about marketing and I've written a book about customer service. And it is harder to sell a book about customer service mm -hmm. because everybody thinks they're good at customer service. Like nobody yep. thinks they're bad at customer service, which is one of the great uh, ironies of this book because when you read this book, you'll realize that you're not nearly as good as you think, but it's mm -hmm. kind of a chicken and egg approach when you're trying to sell a book like that, right? Um, it's yeah, I'll, really I'll, fascinating. I can imagine it. And I will say your the title you came up with couldn't have hurt. I mean, what a title. Hug your haters. Thanks. You know, and, thanks. And, yeah. You, you know, know it, uh, uh, it, it, it's a better title than the actual meaning of that title, which is, you know, answer all your complaints. That's not a very good book title. So hug your haters. Much better. <laughs> <laughs> well, hug your haters got the job done. Well, cool. Before we, you know, dive into, you know, all the best practices for, you know, executing customer service correctly through social media, can can you first just talk a bit about why this is currently important and growing in importance? Well, look, for a really 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 long time, businesses have had it pretty easy in the area of customer service because for really since the time of Pompeii, almost all of our customer interactions have taken place in private, face-to-face, -face, mm -hmm. uh, and then eventually telephone, and then, well, I guess fax temporarily, uh, and then email, right? So almost all the things that, that happened between businesses and their customers took place in private. Now, because of technology and consumer behavior trends, an increasing share of consumer interactions are taking place in public. Social media, ratings and reviews, websites, uh, online forums and communities. And when customer service becomes public, customer service becomes a spectator sport, and that changes the revenue implications for customer service quite a bit. Because back in the day, if a company was not very good at customer service, well, so what? I mean, you're going to disappoint that customer, and that customer might talk negatively about that company, but how many people does that customer really know? Like, how many people do they really talk to? Like, maybe at their church or their job or whatever, but it's not going to be a huge impact on that business probably. Now, though, when tens or hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of people can see how companies handle their customers online, it's a much bigger deal. So companies that are good at customer service – benefit disproportionately today, and companies that are not good at customer service are penalized disproportionately today. Yeah, no, I hear you. And what about like um, 
customer advocacy. Does, is it about the same when you answer customers via email or social? Has that changed at all? Uh, I don't know how it's changed. The research that I did for the book, and, and this book is is very much rooted in research, and that was intentional because, mm-hmm. as I mentioned at the outset, it's already hard to tell people, hey, man, you think you're good at customer service, but you're not as good as you think you are. You should read this book to prove it. Uh, and then if that book is just, Jay says that you should do this thing, that's not really great either. And so this book is is built around research. So it's not just me saying that this is a good idea. We surveyed thousands of Americans about the science of complaints to figure out exactly what's happening today and the trends that businesses need to know to get better at customer service. And, and that kind of gives this a little more heft than just, I think you should do it this way. But what we found, shockingly, well, let me let me tell you a different story, okay? I'll tell you a story. You mentioned the book title. So Hug Your Haters was not supposed to be the title of this book. Hmm. The title of this book, it was supposed to be Under an Hour because the original premise for this book was that speed is the most important thing, that companies that are faster are companies that succeed more, and, and that the most important thing now is to be fast. But I thought, well... If I'm going to write a book about that, I should know whether or not that's true. <laughs> and so yeah. I what, did what a, what, what a daunting task. Take yeah, on. crazy, right? Uh, yeah, you would think all authors would do that, but alas, that's not the case. So <laughs> I did the research and found that it isn't true. Uh, speed is very important, as we talked about in the book, but it's not the most important thing. The most important thing by far is just to answer. And so what we discovered is that the big, the most important thing that a company can do is to answer all their customers. And that's why the book became Hug Your Haters, not Under an Hour, because the thesis now is you answer every complaint in every channel every time. In the research, we found that one-third, a third of all customer complaints are never answered, ever. Wow. It's a huge problem, right? And no response, <laughs> no response is a response. No response... Yeah is a response that says, we don't care about you enough to even acknowledge your dissatisfaction. And so we studied it exclusively, and to answer your original question, when you answer a customer's complaint, okay? Now, this doesn't mean you solve it, okay? This doesn't mean you fix the problem. It just means you answer it. It can increase their advocacy by as much as 30%. Wow. And and that impact is greater online, online social media, it's more like 50%. Why? Because people who complain in social don't anticipate that they're going to hear back because so Uh often they don't, right? So you're, you're, you're blowing people's minds because they don't always think that they're going to get an answer on Twitter or Facebook. That makes sense. That makes sense. So basically they're not, you're just exceeding, like more than exceeding expectations uh, based on what people would think was going to happen. And for that, you get the extra bonus of yeah. the advocacy and getting those people to come around. Make makes sense. And what about the financial impact? I, I saw you mentioned something in there, and I know people like Tony Shea at Zappos, they actually look at customer service as an extension of marketing in regards to their yeah. budget. Yeah. So why why would somebody like that think that way? Well, let me, let me just touch on expectations again real quick before I answer that question. To give you a comparison, if you answer uh, a customer's complaint on via phone, it increases their advocacy by like 10% or less. But if you answer a customer's complaint on Twitter, it increases their advocacy by like 40% because they expect you to answer the phone. Mm-hmm. Right, you're not. Get, you're not getting. It's like it, when you when you go in your office and you turn on the lights and the lights actually come on. You're not like hell yeah, electric company way to deliver, <laughs> right? It's just you know you just expect that to happen. They don't get any credit for that. Like you're not high five and when the you know trash guy comes and picks up your trash either. It just yeah. is, right? So they don't have any expectation opportunity there. Right now, there's a colossal expectation opportunity for businesses who, who move to social media and use that as a way to delight, uh, to, to delight their customers. But there's a huge revenue impact there. So this is one of the most powerful things I can tell you. Customers, well, I mean, it, it, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. Customers, customers who have a problem and that problem is successfully fixed by the business, buy more stuff 
than customers that never had a problem. So that is my your point. best customers, your most valuable customers financially are the customers who had a problem that you fixed. I, was, I, that, I mentioned that, that in a presentation insane. a few months ago. It's crazy. I mentioned that in a presentation a few months ago, and a guy comes up to me afterwards and says, Jay, love the keynote. I used to work for Whirlpool, the uh, appliances company. Mm -hmm. I used to work for Whirlpool. We had a division, a sales division at Whirlpool, and what would happen is when customers would call in with a problem, if we could fix the problem, we would then take that customer's name and put it on a list. And then this special sales division, two weeks later, would call that customer and try and sell them a different Whirlpool appliance. And guess what, Jay? It was the most profitable sales team in the company. That's a real, real, real world example right there. You know, but once you're saying, and again, this is, this is to, you know, what I was talking about, how I got so much more out of this book than I thought I was going to. It's like those, some of those things are just, they're, I, I guess once, you know, you know it to be a fact, they make complete sense, right? But it's just some of the most obvious things are, aren't obvious until they're stated, you know, uh, you know, as such. And, and that just make it makes complete sense now that you're saying it, I guess, you know, and, and there's research backing it up. But that's still a little surprising we, to hear. We all know, everybody knows, everybody knows that it makes sense to retain the customers you've already earned mm -hmm. as opposed to constantly churning customers and having to replace them, right? Like there's no – there's no debate to that. Nobody's going to say, like, no, retention isn't important. Churn's good. Like, no, that's just – it is, right? It's just a fact. Mm -hmm. You learn that the first day in business, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody knows that. But we don't actually run companies that way. It's not how we actually spend our money. So uh, some research that Adobe did before the uh, – I should say after the book came out, so it's not in the book. Adobe did some research that found that in business to business – the average B2B company gets 40% of its revenue each year from current customers. Now, your results may vary, but on average, it's 40%. On average, the typical B2B company spends 2% of revenue on customer service. Wow. And that includes people, that includes software, that includes the whole deal, 2%. So you're investing 2 to maintain 40 that ratio does not seem right. It's crazy. So one of the things that I talk about a lot now is without great customer service, great marketing is a waste of time. <laughs> it's funny you say it. I say that all the time. I was like, that's the one little thing that gets always missed in all these sales and marketing stuff that you learn about is we well, got to have a good product. <laughs> You gotta have good service, and that just doesn't get talked about. So it's wonderful that you know a marketing guy has realized that and brought That's what to I light. Keep I mean, people. I'm like, you know what? People they come to me all the time. I say, Jay, all the things you talked about and hug your haters makes a lot of sense, but it's, it's going to take a lot of work for us to be really good at customer service on Twitter and really good at customer service on Facebook and eventually really good at customer service on Instagram and Snapchat. And we got to pay attention to Yelp and TripAdvisor and all this other stuff. Like that's going to take a lot of time, Jay. We don't have time to do that. And I say that is total bullshit. You <laughs> totally have time. What you should do is spend less money on marketing and spend more money on customer service. And I say that as a marketing consultant. Right. Right. No. No, I know. I mean, what, what, what better validation do you get from a guy who's, you know, supposedly and potentially taking money out of his own pocket just to tell the right. people the right way to spend their money? You know, and and your treadmill. clients are ones who will pay you big bucks, right? And you're running telling on a treadmill them, hey. is no way to run a business, right? And that's what happens, right? We're, we're doing all this marketing, we get customers, and the service sucks, and so they leave. And then we got to get more customers, and then they leave. We got to get more customers, and they leave. You never, you never mm -hmm. get ahead, man. It's 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 one step forward, two steps back. And and now that customer service is a spectator sport, you can actually make customer service, you know, your real competitive advantage. I talk about the the story about Discover Card in the book. I think it's a really good example of this in practice. And so, you you may know, people may know that Discover Card invented cash back. So the whole idea of you get cash back under purchases, they invented that whole concept like 25 years ago, something like that. It was their deal. That was their competitive advantage against Visa and MasterCard and American Express for a long, long time. 
And then five years ago or so, the guys at Capital One came mm-hmm. on the scene, and they hired Jennifer Garner, and they hired Samuel L. Jackson, and they spent a ton of money on television ads to convince all of us that, no, man, Capital One are the guys who do cash back. And so three years ago, Discover Card had an emergency meeting of their executives and said, guys, we no longer have a reason to exist Because the thing that made us special, nobody thinks about us for that anymore. Somebody came in our backyard and just drank our milkshake. So now what? What can we own? What can be our thing, right? Because, frankly, credit cards are credit cards are credit cards in large measure. So what can be our thing? And so somebody said, okay, well, what if – What if we decided to be the best company, not just in cards, but in all the financial services at customer service? What would that require? What would we have to do to be so much better at customer service than anybody else in the industry that we could actually use it as our competitive weapon? And so they did a bunch of analysis and a bunch of research and hired a bunch of consultants, and they figured out that if they could answer every customer in every channel, every time, Within 20 minutes, 24 hours a day, they would be so much better than anybody else that they could use it as the core of their marketing. And they said, let's do it. So they spent all kinds of money on software, re-engineered tons of internal processes, hired a ton of people. And now Discover answers every question in every channel, every time, within 20 minutes. Phone, email, Twitter, Facebook, skywriting, you know, smoke signal, whatever, 20 minutes or less, that's their thing. And if you've seen any of their TV commercials in the last year, now all of their television commercials are all about we're better at customer service than anybody else. It saved their company because they said, look, customer service is marketing if we can do it better than everybody else in our industry. Yeah, I mean, it it, it makes so much sense. It really does. And I, I love hearing stories like that because that what does that mean from me and you, right? You know, the more and more people spin on this, it's just going to create a better experience for everybody, you know. And once everybody catches on and you stop, you know, some of that money shifting from convincing people to use your services to actually making the services bigger and better, it's just it's just one of those neat things that you kind of go through life and it's like, oh. Well, this is good for all of us, and then you know, more power yeah. to that company who's doing it. Yeah. So it's wonderful hearing stories like that, especially for a big company like that, because and they're not the only one. I mean, obviously Zappos did this. You know, companies like Southwest Airlines, and 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 you're seeing more and more and more and more companies, um, you know, getting involved in in you know in, in answering questions and doing stuff. So it's just going to make everybody's life better. And and those are the kinds of things that that's just a it's a good win win in life. And and I love hearing it. And you, I've more than convinced me and I'm sure all the listeners that this is a way to go. So let's let's start at the top here. What how would a company get going here? I mean, do you have any advice for like the first step in getting the customer uh, service department or the company as a whole social in that regards? Do you have yeah. any pointers there? Yeah. The first thing we always do is perform what we call an honesty audit. And so what we do is look at a cross section of all of the customer interactions, phone, email, social, and beyond, to get a sense for what the real volume is, what kinds of questions customers are actually asking, and whether and when the business is actually responding, and if so, what are they saying? And we call it an honesty audit not because the business is lying to customers, but in many cases, the business is lying to itself. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, the only people who really understand customer service in an organization are in customer service. And for most other parts of the industry or the business, they're like, yeah, 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 the customer service guys, you know, they're great. They got it handled, whatever. They really have no idea what's going on. If you say, okay, what's your ratio of emails to calls to social media, customer interactions, unless you're in customer service, they have no idea. And and so what happens, a lot of stories and anecdotes get told around the business that convinces everybody that they're really good at this. Meanwhile, they may not be. And so the honesty audit takes a cross-section of all those different customer interactions, when you look at that, you can say, oh, actually, you know, maybe we're understaffed here, we're overstaffed here, we're taking too long to answer here, we're, you know, we're not answering these particular types of questions with authenticity. It just gives you kind of a lay of the land. So that's the first thing we do is an honesty audit. Mm-hmm. 
Oh, that's the very first thing. And what would be the next step to, so, to get them going? Yes, yeah, so the next step we would we would look at is to say, okay, now how can we um, improve the things that that really need to be improved uh, to to essentially exceed customer expectations. That's what this is really all about, right? You mm-hmm. you want to exceed customer expectations with your service so much that it makes word of mouth involuntary. You want customers to say, I am compelled to tell somebody about what a great experience I had. That's the yeah. test. That's the test, right? Where 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 customers become volunteer marketers, and they say to their friends, "You won't believe what happened to me when dot dot dot," right? And the end of that sentence is, "I contacted this business via Twitter, or I called them, or whatever," right? So, you have to figure out what what the what you can do to make that happen, and so. Sometimes you can lead with speed, and that's what Discover Card does, right? Response time is kind of their calling card. And so you figure out, all right, what do we have to do to get faster? Sometimes you can lead by um, by channel breadth. So there's businesses that we work with who succeed and lead because you can contact them in every way, shape, or form, right? You can fax them. You can WhatsApp them. You can Facebook message them. You can get customer service on Snapchat. I mean, you can... However you want to contact them, they'll handle it. There's other businesses that lead with humanity, who, who train their customer service reps to, to answer most um, customer questions with videos or to be very over-the-top over the empathetic, things like that, right? So you kind of map out the, the portions of the program that you can do so great that customers don't expect it uh, and then you sort of push those levers over time because you can't do this instantaneously, uh, and mm-hmm. that's where you end up. Gotcha. Awesome. Now you, you, you kind of the touched... company uh, for bigger companies, it's a software play too. Like you, you know, there's definitely a all right, especially in social. Like what software are we using to manage the social? And then in bigger companies, it's how does the social media software integrate with the email software and or the phone uh, call center software? And so that gets a little. You know, can can get a little confusing and complicated, but but in in certain cases, it's really important too. Gotcha, gotcha. So basically, uh, take you know, do your audit, see where you have your rooms for improvement, and then you know, decide what you want to kill it at, and then execute and kill it, right? And yeah, then and you there's know, all it's all obviously kinds of stuff. Be... there's all kinds of specific stuff, right? Like I talked about this book, exactly. Like, reply yeah. only twice, right? You never respond to a customer more than twice in public. Uh, because it's counterproductive and and it's a waste of time. And so there's you, you also never channel shift on the first reply. So one of the things that a lot of companies are guilty of now that drives customers crazy is let's say somebody complains on Facebook. Hey, you know, you guys suck, whatever. Uh, the customer service person who handles Facebook will say, we're terribly sorry to hear that. Please call us at 888, whatever, whatever. We'd like to talk to you about it. Well, the customer in some cases, like, man, I just finished calling you. And the reason I'm mad is that I didn't get the answer I wanted to get from the call center or I had to wait on hold too long. So I went to Facebook as sort of the place of last resort. And what you're doing is telling me to go back to the place I just was. Mm. So, you know, you never want to channel shift in the first reply. You always want to say, um, thanks so much. How can we help you? Or if for some reason you don't want to do it publicly, uh, which is pretty common in financial services and healthcare, you would say, hey, uh, we're terribly sorry. Please send us a private message with your account information, and we'll look into it. And then after that, if you if you have to, for whatever reason, have them talk to somebody on the phone, then you can send them back to the phone. But you should never do that on the first reply because it makes people really mad sometimes. Great pointer. And, my, and I, I felt my anxiety level going up, actually, when you were, talking, when you yeah. were saying, yeah, I, I know that feeling. It's like, what? No. Come on, I'm your customer, right? You know, yeah, no, I, I, know, I know, I know that. I mean, I, I really kind of felt my anxiety going up as you were saying that. So you, you kind of touched on this a bit, but and I know you have different methodologies uh, for dealing with each. But to talk about you know the two types of haters, and then mm-hmm. you know, in your opinion, and your, you know, your ingredients for you know solving you know each one um, respectively. So what we found in the book, and and we didn't know this to be true until we did the research, is that there really are two different types of of complainers, different types of haters out there. There are offstage haters, 
and I call them off stage because they continue to complain in private. So they use phone and email primarily uh, to complain. And then there are on stage haters that complain in public. So that's social media, review sites, discussion boards and forums, et cetera. And the people who complain off stage are a little older, a little less technology savvy, a little less social media savvy uh, than the than the on stage haters. Take it's it not, easy, Jay. Take it easy. <laughs> I'm, an not, off-stage, I'm an off stage. I'm an off stage hater. <laughs> yeah, it's, but you know what's interesting is it's not. Those differences aren't aren't huge actually. It's not. You, it's not like your grandparents are off stage and millennials are on stage. You know, like that's true, kinda, but it's it's not. It's not really like mm-hmm. that. So, what's interesting is is that the big difference between the two is expectations. Right? We've talked about that a little bit. If you complain off stage, phone and email, you expect and anticipate to hear back from the business. Ninety percent of the people who complain via phone or email expect the business to get back to them. Ninety percent. Less than half of the people who complain in social expect to hear back from the business. So if you really need an answer, you're not just complaining, you're not just griping, you need an answer. In many cases, you will complain off stage. Mm-hmm. If you're just complaining about the business, not necessarily complaining, you know, to them, but you're just griping that these guys suck. In many cases, that's where you go on stage, Twitter, Facebook, Yelp, TripAdvisor, et cetera. And so the huge opportunity for businesses is to answer the on stage people because, again, they don't expect it. And so if you're just like, you know what, I don't like these guys, whatever, on Twitter, then they just pop out of the woodwork and say, hey, uh, I know you weren't tweeting at us, but we saw you mentioned us, and we're sorry you're unhappy. How can we help you? They're like, whoa. Mm hmm. Game changer, right? They just didn't see that coming. So that's where you get that really significant uh, advocacy and loyalty bump is when you answer people who aren't necessarily looking for an answer. All right. And, and how, how do you uh, – you have some pretty cool acronym, acronyms that you, you mentioned for each one that, that kind of drive home your formula for dealing with each. Can you dig into those uh, quickly here? Yeah, it's actually – one of the things I did in the book, which I think is, is interesting, I did it in the last book too, is um, the, there's actually a quick reference guide at the, at the back of the book, which takes all the kind of key points uh, from each chapter – and summarizes it so people can go back and refer to it uh, after they read the book and without having to reread the whole book, uh, it's pretty effective. So we think about offstage haters, people who complain phone and email. The acronym that we use there is OURS, H-O-U-R-S, and that stands for Be Human, uh, which is particularly important uh, on phone and email because a lot of times those interactions don't come off very human, right? How many times have you called a call center uh, and it feels like the person on the other line is having like the worst day ever? And they may be, but it doesn't make the interaction with that person or that company feel very good, you know, when, and plus you also get, you know, phone trees and press three for this and five for that, or you get a lot of, you know, email autoresponders. It just, it's just not very good. So be human is, uh, is one point there. The other one is is use one channel. We were talking about channel shifting a minute ago. Uh, Unify your data is the U in that acronym, uh, which is where you get into the, hey, the the email guys have one database and the social media guys have one database and the phone guys have one database, uh, or how often does this happen? So you call, uh, this happens a lot with airlines in particular or credit card companies. You call up, right? And, and while you're waiting, they ask you to put in your account number. Oh, so you God. put in your account number on your phone, like boop, 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 boop. And then you yep. get a person who's like, hi, I'm Julie. What's your account number? Yes. You're like, uh, Julie, I'm almost positive that four seconds ago I put in my account number. So how do you not have that? <laughs> right? So that happens all the time, uh, which oh. is super annoying. Uh, resolve the issue is is one that's particularly important for for offstage uh, to actually solve the problem because when when you're when you're in a social media environment you you can kind of go back and forth you're not necessarily going to be able to solve everything in one tweet but on the phone or via email like don't kick the 
you know, can down the curb and say, well, we'll call you back, whatever, whatever you can do, solve it right then. Uh, it's, it's much higher customer satisfaction that way. And then the last one is, is with speed. And so when we talk about speed, and I mentioned that the book was originally going to be only about speed, it's still super important. When we talk about speed, oftentimes you would think that, that I'm referencing social media. And of course, speed is important in social media, but speed is just as, if not more important, uh, off stage. So one of the things that we learned in the book and the research of the book, which is crazy, right, is that businesses take an average of 44 hours to reply to an email. Wow. That's a really long time, right? I mean, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's almost two days, and that okay. is not going to work. The other thing, the other stat I love from the book is that I believe it's 85%, I think that's the number, I think it's 85% of Americans say that they hate to wait on hold. Which always makes me think, okay, who are the other 15%? (laughs) Like, what's their deal? Like, they just love smooth jazz so much (laughs) that they're willing to wait on hold. They want to wait on hold. They don't don't have Spotify, but they love smooth jazz. So (laughs) waiting on hold is about the worst thing you can make somebody do now because, you know, look, it's a different era now, right? If you waited on hold 15 minutes – Say three years ago, you'd be like, yeah, that kind of sucked, but whatever. Fifteen minutes today feels like a really long time. Yeah, it's just our, yeah. our perception of time has changed a lot because of social media, and and so we just we've got to have more people answering to get through the calls more quickly. So that's ours. H O U R S. Okay. Now moving on to on stage. So on stage haters, the acronym is fears. F E A R S. Fears. And that stands for find all mentions. F is find all mentions. And, and what I mean by that is, is I, I mentioned earlier that where you can really blow people's mind is when you answer the folks who don't expect to get an answer from you. And the only way that can happen is if you find mentions of your business or your products or your people that aren't necessarily tagged or sent to you directly. So you've just got to look a little harder in social media and in discussion boards. Like there's a lot of chatter about companies in discussion boards and forums that they never see because they never look for them. So you got to okay. find all mentions. you got to look a little well, harder. Can, can you give a pointer on that? Like uh, are there some good tools to use for that? Well, certainly uh, any sort of legitimate social media – uh, management software will, will be able to help you uh, find more of those keyword-driven mentions about your business, especially on Twitter, Facebook, and places like that. We use uh, Sprout Social in my company. There's tons of other good ones, Hootsuite, uh, Spreadfast. There's there's lots and lots. Mention.net is one that's uh, free for basic users. So there's lots of them out there. And then for okay. discussion boards and forums, unfortunately, there really isn't a – software package that, that that finds all the discussion boards. Some of the more advanced social listening tools will for, for big companies like Sysimos or Sprinkler. Um, the, you know, for, for small and medium-sized businesses and certainly for individuals, the best approach is probably to just find the forums that matter in your industry and just go and look for your name once every couple of days. You know, just say, okay, somebody take 10 minutes and do this on a regular basis is probably the fastest way to do it. Okay. All right. Um, I think you're on E. E. So E is display empathy. And I've got some great examples uh, in the book about sort of empathy and, and lack of empathy. You can't control whether customers complain. You can totally control what happens next. Mm-hmm. And there is a lot of oxygen on the high road. And a lot of times customers – say things in a way that is not complimentary. And sometimes, especially online, more so than phone and email, I think, customers can get a little out of hand, right? And they're real snarky and real mean. And of course, the human reaction, the natural human reaction is to, you know, is to feel like you're being attacked, is to feel like somebody is calling your baby ugly and and to essentially fight fire with fire and say, okay, customer, if you're going to be negative, then we're going to be negative right back. Um, and that is counterproductive, especially when you're dealing with a complaint that isn't public because then everybody can see that you took the bait and you got real angry as well. So 
you don't understand that person's story. That that customer could be having the worst day of their lives, and you just got caught in the crossfire. So you can control how you handle every response. And so having empathy for the customer and being genuinely sorry is really important, and it's something we do a lot of training on. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah, I think Bill Clinton did it best, right? Well, I feel yeah. your pain. And but it's 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 kind of like a joke to say that, but if you want to take a step back, um, there's genius in that, um, and that's that's probably what what got him elected. You know the way he was, you know, yeah. he got millions and millions of people for him to express, you know, empathy. And and well, you know, I've heard that you know over the years many times, and it's like <laughs> that wasn't. It's funny to say it in his voice and make a joke about it, but um, it was. It was real and it was powerful, yeah. and yeah. It, he he was a master of influence, and um, and that's that's what he did. Um, so um, answers, uh, uh, you're an A, I believe. Yep, yeah, A is answer publicly, and and we talked about this a little bit earlier uh, with regards to channel shifting. Sometimes you get a tendency to say, "Hey, somebody says something negative about us on Twitter. Let's let's answer back with a direct message." Or, or let's answer back with a private message on Facebook. Let's kind of sweep this under the rug. Mm-hmm. And that kind of robs you of the opportunity to deliver great service in public, turn it into a spectator sport, and, and have everybody see how good you are. So mm-hmm. I, I understand the temptation to say, hey, let's take bad news and make it private. But when you do that, if you're good at answering, then you don't get any credit for that. So Mm -hmm. we believe you should keep everything public unless you absolutely have to take it private to get an account number or something along those lines. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, And uh, R? R uh, is reply only twice, which I I nodded to earlier, and that's the idea of if somebody says, we hate you, you answer back, we're terribly sorry, Uh, how can we help? And they answer back, I don't need your help, I just hate you. And you answer back, well, we must have really done something this time. We'd sure like to talk to you about it uh, to figure this out. Could you give us a call or a direct message or email us here? And they come back a third time and say, well, I don't want to email you. I just hate you. At that point, you just walk away because that person has demonstrated that they don't actually want help. Uh, Mm -hmm. You've given them two legitimate chances. You've given them multiple contact opportunities. They don't want to help. They just just want to – uh, complain and, and and nothing you do at this point is going to change their mind. Uh, mm-hmm. and so just walk away. Um, just just move on to the next one. And so this idea of kind of getting into this lengthy tit for tat with customers on Twitter or Facebook or something like that, Yelp, uh, it doesn't it just doesn't benefit anybody. So answer twice and then keep on moving. Gotcha. And the uh, last one. The last one is switch channels. So that's uh, circumstances where you do actually go from Facebook, for example, to phone, from Facebook to email, from Facebook to somewhere else, but only once you've done that initial interaction on that channel. We talked about not channel shifting initially. So it's okay to say, all right, we have answered you, but to solve this, we have to go somewhere else. That's gotcha. okay as long as you interact with them the first time in the channel that they pick. Because we got to remember, okay, customers have a lot of contact options now. They could call you. They could email you. They could fax you, I guess. They could send you a letter. They could come see you at your place of business. They could do a lot of things, but they chose Facebook, and that wasn't random. They didn't, they didn't spin a roulette wheel of contact mechanisms and land on F. Right? They picked Facebook because for whatever reason, they feel like that's their best shot at getting their shit handled. So mm-hmm. you got to respect that, right? They, like, they picked it because that's what they want. And too many businesses, I find, uh, are, are too quick to say, well, I know you pick Facebook, but we, as a business, prefer to handle you via email, so why don't you email us instead? And that's very disrespectful of the customer's choice and their time and, and just kind of ha- their preference, right? So. What we tell clients all the time is we have to get to the point where we are answering customers in the channels that they prefer instead of only answering customers in the channels that the business prefers. Gotcha. Makes sense. Now, you, you've alluded to speed, I mean, uh, uh, you know, a couple times, and even, you know, you mentioned that your original book name was going to be about yeah. speed. Um, but can you – Define exactly like how quickly you should reply to on stage haters. Should it be instant? 
Well, I wouldn't say instant, because when you reply instantly in the true sense of that word, you, you run the risk of, of replying without empathy. So fast but not instant is the right way to go. The research that we conducted for Hug Your Haters found that approximately half, a little less than half, of people who complain in social media expect a reply within one hour. So okay. what we always tell people is, look, if you can set it up so that you can answer your customers inside of an hour in social media, you're in great shape. Okay. And that, you know, I think that you probably, you know, there's a bit of a sigh of relief there for a lot of people. You know, that that's the doing that will put your put you on the map of great customer service. So it doesn't have to be boom, boom, boom every second, every time, because that does just the sound of it. Even if I had all the resources in the world, seems a little bit daunting. But, you know, if you can get it, you know, within an hour, you know, if you want to go yeah. for 20, 30, 40, 50 minutes, go for it. But within an hour. That that will suffice based on everything that Jay has seen out there, and, and and I can attest in his book. There's tons of research, so you know these aren't anecdotal type of. It does, uh, you know, and it does depend a little bit on the industry, of course, because um, you have to look at it this way: what, how much will an hour delay negatively impact the customer? Mm-hmm. Right. So in some industries, like it's fine. If you're if you're in yeah, banking no, yeah. or automotive or retail or restaurants or a lot of other industries, an hour's fine. Like whatever. But if you're in uh, cable television, right? So mm-hmm. you know, if you're in cable television and and somebody's uh, internet goes out or their TV goes out, an hour. People are losing it right after an hour. They're freaking out, right? Yeah. So you, you can't, it can't. That's a it's good point. Be faster than that, right? So airlines, same way. If your flight's canceled, and you're like Delta, help me, I'm stranded in Des Moines. Like an hour is not going to get it done, right? So they're going to get back yeah. to you in like five minutes, right? Because that just you just have to. And so some of it's just what's what's the time horizon in your business but but most companies and i mean the overwhelming majority of companies if if you can do it inside an hour consistently you're in great shape Gotcha. All right. Uh, running a little bit short on time, and I have a lot of questions I want to get your answers to. So I'm going to try to maybe do like a, 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 a fire lightning drill round? here. Yeah, lightning right. round. I'm All right. excited. Okay. Four okay, answers, here we go. Four, four word answers. Here we go. All right. What is your advice for censoring people, like removing their comment or even hiding it on Facebook from everyone except for the person who left it? Should this ever be done, even for like right. crazies? Uh, I would not delete anybody's comment uh, without letting them know. Uh, but the hiding it uh, from everybody else, uh, the Facebook has a, a way that you can hide it uh, so that nobody sees it but them. Yeah, I'm okay with that in certain situations. Okay, gotcha. Back channel support, like a customer service Twitter account. What are your thoughts there? You know, it's a really interesting question. Um, a lot of companies do have that, right? It's at company name help or at company name service. And, and so customer service has its own Twitter. I believe uh, that if you're really, really good at customer service, why would you want to hide it? Like mm-hmm. if, you're great, if you're great at this and you've invested time to be great at it, why would you want it to have its own account? Why wouldn't you want your main account to have customer service in there so more people can see you being great at it? Now, if you're not very good at customer service, then absolutely, you should have a separate account. <laughs> but, but if you're really good at it, I would find them. Yeah, cool. Yeah, and to circle back to your original point, you lose that 40% of uh, right. advocacy opportunity. Right. All right, pinning a tweet when your service is off. Good, bad idea, and things to consider if you do decide to do that. So pin your tweet to the top of your account when, when you're actually having an outage or some sort of known issue? Or if you're just off, if your customer service ends at a certain time. Oh, oh if you, yeah, if you're done at night. Yeah, absolutely should. Absolutely. Especially, especially if you have some other... Um, a service opportunity that is open, right? So let's say for whatever reason your social care stops at 5 p.m. but email goes to 9, I would absolutely pin a tweet every night that says, hey, uh, we stop at 5, but phones open until 9. Here's how you get a hold of them. Gotcha. All right, should you expect an increase or decrease in call volume by handling complaints socially? Well, the the thesis would be that you get fewer calls, right? That that as you do more stuff in social, you get fewer calls because people will use social instead of calling. 
Today, what we're seeing in a lot of cases is the same amount of calls and more social, which okay. is troubling because it, it causes some it causes some financial issues. That's what we're seeing today. Um, where that ends up in another year or two, I don't know. Gotcha, gotcha. But it's something to consider if you're you know big company mm-hmm. looking to get into this. Don't just automatically assume that you're going to be able to ha- have less less people on the phones. It may not be the case. All right, um, handling trolls. You know. Um, you know, w- w- this this can be tricky. You know, w- what's your advice for a company for dealing with those people? First you thing know, is, you never know just... somebody's a troll. You don't know somebody's a troll until their second reply. Gotcha. Right, and and a lot of times people will say somebody just leaves one particularly nasty comment and they get labeled a troll. And it's like, look, you don't know that that person is a troll until you try to help them, and then they demonstrate that they don't want help. Just because somebody's nasty doesn't mean that that they are out of bounds. It just means that they're nasty. Like there's lots of people out there uh, who are nasty, especially if they're having a bad day or having a problem. So uh, mm-hmm. I think the, the the challenge is saying, well, you know, anything negative means they're a troll. Therefore, we're not going to answer. Answer them. My advice is you answer everybody. When I say every customer, I don't mean every customer except for angry customers. I don't mean every <laughs> customer except for mean customers. I mean every customer. And then mm-hmm. if on the second reply they're clearly a troll, well then you keep on walking. But you don't gotcha. know that until the second reply. So your advice is follow your original advice. <laughs> yeah. You know, go go with the fears. All right, awesome. Uh, what about consistency with messaging? Do you, do you just give employees basic parameters and let them communicate as they see fit? You know, in other words, like naturally, or do you feel it should be more structured with consistent messaging and verbiage? In between is the answer. Uh, will, you, will you have some sample responses to common questions so that reps can get a feel for what would be a way that you might be able to say it? And so you want to have some guidelines there, but, but obviously allow them to put their own humanity in there so that it sounds authentic. The nice thing is a lot of the software now, uh, Spreadfast, Sprout Social, uh, Clara Bridge, which is one of our partners, Converse Social, a lot of the good uh, software out there has – the ability for you to create sample responses for, for common questions and store it in the software so that your reps on Twitter and Facebook, et cetera, can, can pull that in and then modify it so it sounds like their own voice. Perfect. That was a wonderful answer. Awesome. Thanks for that advice. Yeah. What about self-service customer service? You know, a lot of times people, you know, might be listening to this and think, well, my FAQs or my frequently asked questions are worthless. What are your thoughts there? Or do you have any other creative ideas? The, the cheapest phone call is the one that was never placed. Uh, Mm -hmm. So the research, uh, I didn't do this research, but it's cited in the book, says that 70, either 70 or 72 percent of consumers say that they would prefer to find an answer on a website instead of call. So Mm -hmm. what that means is that self-serve information, right, self-service is not a dereliction of duty. You're actually doing your customers a favor. So mm-hmm. I, I've got tons and tons and tons of clients who have FAQs, and none of them are with even, even close to being good enough, right? They're not nearly comprehensive enough. They're not big enough. They're not current enough. Uh, you know, you're answering literally the frequently asked questions. Maybe you should answer all questions, right, and, and, and try to develop a real repository of, of help docs and things that people can find easily so they can get more and more of their questions answered themselves online. Gotcha. Awesome. All right, a couple last questions. One, community-based service. Can you speak about what this is and who that might be a good uh, good fit for? Yeah, same same thing, right? Um, almost with, with self-service. The huge trend and really important, this idea of, hey, maybe we could get our customers to solve problems that our other customers have. Customers mm-hmm. love that. The psychology of that is really powerful. So the uh, simplest form would be you create a Facebook group for your customers uh, and you ask some of your, your best customers, the ones who really know the product, to spend some time in there and you give them some sort of gift certificate or special T-shirt or recognition as a, um, as a community support leader. Uh, and what you do is you say, all right, we want to try and have 80% of our, of our common questions answered by customers. And then the hard 10, 20%, the company answers answers, brings your customer service costs way down, and customers actually love it in many cases. Okay, awesome. Because, uh, uh, and the reason that is they trust each other, right? Yeah. And they trust each other more than they trust the company. It doesn't matter what company it is. Yeah, and I don't think anybody needs any, any any to be sold on that statement. You know, referrals, recommendations from friends are much more powerful than any sort of marketing Absolutely. message you could ever put out there. Okay, what about measurement? 
how, how can a company measure their efforts here once they're, you know, they've put all this awesome advice that you're giving to action? Well, classically, what people are going to look at is number of calls, number of tweets, you know, number of people served. You're going to look at average call volume. You're going to look at things like that, and it's all fine. But but ultimately, what you want to look at is is how much did people appreciate uh, the support that they got by channel, and does it does it exceed their expectations? And so, classically, a net promoter score type question on a scale of you know one to ten, how much did you love your service today? And you ask that question of people who were helped via Twitter, via Facebook, via Yelp, via phone, whatever, to see where they appreciate it better is great. The other thing that we work on a lot is called effort score. So you ask a cross-section of customers, how hard or easy was it for you to get an answer to your question today? Because ultimately what you're trying to do is take friction out of the equation. If you can make it easy for them, they will love you more. So so looking at effort uh, as a metric is, is something that I think has a lot of merit moving forward. Okay, very cool. And I know I said that was the last question, but actually one, one other. What, sure. What's a couple of the most common mistakes people make with social customer service that you know sh- they should avoid? Um, I think part of it is, is one of the mistakes is picking and choosing, right? It's saying, hey, we're going to do social customer service, but we're only going to answer certain customers uh, at certain times in certain circumstances. Uh, you're, you're kind of cherry picking your involvement, and I don't think that's very useful. And the other thing is companies get involved in social customer service, but then don't tell their customers that that's true, right? They, they don't use they don't use marketing to say, hey, you used to only be able to call us, and now we're here to help you on Twitter and Facebook. Like somebody should be told that. Uh, yeah. and, and so they they have this program, but they're, it's not it, it doesn't. No one knows, right? It's it's not merchandised anywhere. Oh, great point. And so then they're like, well, how come no one's using Twitter? It's like, well, man, because no one knew they could do that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. It's just, it's the same, you know, it's very similar to, you know, R&D creates this amazing feature and then the marketing doesn't, it never talks about it. <laughs> right? Because yeah, customers, so. you know, how often does customer really need support? Every once in a while, probably. So they're not spending time like, hey, you know, it'd be interesting. I wonder if these guys do Twitter customer service now. Like, they're not. I don't care that much, right? So you got to tell them what's possible. Uh, and a lot of times what I find is somewhat, somewhat ironic is that there's not enough marketing for customer service. Yeah, that is ironic. That's a great point, though. It's a great point. Well, Jay, that's awesome, awesome, awesome stuff. Do you have any parting thoughts before we have to let you go? Uh, I hope everybody does it. You know, I, I can guarantee if you do it right and do it well, uh, you're going to make money, save money, uh, both of those things, which uh, which is good. Awesome. And how can people continue to learn from you, either in uh, this book, or in general? Yeah, the book is HugYourHaters.com. We have a whole online course about these topics as well called KeepYourCustomersCourse.com. Uh, you can find me at JayBayer.com. And that's J-A-Y-B-A-E-R at yes, J-Bear. All right. Yeah. Awesome, Jay. Really appreciate your time, your insight, right. and your awesome advice. I know you're going to help uh, help a few people out there, and I really appreciate it. Until next My time. My pleasure. See you All right. Bye-bye.